Again, welcome everyone as you're logging into tonight's program, Courageous Conversations About Race and Systemic Racism in America. My name is Charlene Margo and I'm the founder of the Parent Education Series and co-founder of nonprofit, The Parent Venture. As you can imagine, tonight's topic could not be more timely and we are delighted to have with us Dr. Donald Grant from Pacific Oaks College. We're gonna be telling you a little bit more about him in just a minute or so. But first of all, I wanna introduce you to Rita Allen, who is the president of the Fremont Union High Schools Foundation. Welcome, Rita. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. And before we get to the main program, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the High Schools Foundation. So uh, welcome everybody. We're so glad you could be here. Again, my name is Rita Allen and I am the president of the Fremont Union High Schools Foundation. I'm joined by fellow board member and Parent Resource Network co-chair Benifer Dastur. The, the foundation is a nonprofit corporation that whose mission is to raise funds to support education programs that benefit every student in our district. We fund programs that enrich students' lives, touching everything from the sciences to the arts to athletics. If you visit our website, you can see a complete list of what we fund. We do our best to add value to your students' educational experience and invite you to connect with us. Please visit our website, fuhsfoundation.org, and we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. If you don't already, oh, excuse me, don't already receive it, you can do this on the homepage of our website, or you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram to see upcoming events, helpful information, and stories about your students. And now I'd like to turn it over to Benifer, who will tell you more about the Parent Resource Network. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, the Parent Resource Network is an initiative of the foundation to promote parent engagement and also connect high school parents to uh, resources in the key areas of academic, college and career support and diversity and inclusion. If you visit our Parent Resource Network page on the foundation website, you can find a plethora of resources that could be helpful to you in all of these key areas. Uh, to promote our mission to support the high school parents, we also host parent education nights, just as the one that you're attending today. Um, we hope you find this conversation with Dr. Grant helpful, and we look forward to your feedback. Thank you. And I give it back to Charlene. Thank you, Rita and Benifer. We are so pleased to be here tonight and very grateful to the Fremont Union High Schools Foundation for their support of high quality parent education in our communities. Again, a really important topic tonight, courageous conversations about race and systemic racism in America. As Dr. Grant said, he's not running out of material anytime soon. Um, tonight, he'll be talking to you for about 40, 40 minutes, and then we will have time for questions from you, the audience. So please, if you would, use the chat button for comments to us, to one another, and the Q&A button for questions. Please keep them sort of short and general if you could. We wanna to get to as many of your questions as we can tonight, since the parent engagement is very important part of this program. So again, content, Q&A, chat button, Q&A button for questions, okay? All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's keynote speaker. Dr. Donald Grant began his career as a middle school science teacher in Baltimore, Maryland, after graduating from Hampton University with a BS in biology. He holds a doctorate in clinical psychology and serves in two executive director roles, one with his consulting firm, Mindful Training Solutions, and the other with the Center for Community and Social Impact at Pacific Oaks College. Dr. Grant is a national thought leader in race and systemic racism, a social cultural analyst, mental health and mindfulness expert, educator, and social services advocate. He's also an international speaker and workshop facilitator, film and TV consultant, and a published author. His new book, A Moon for Us All, integrates Black history into a family narrative, 
for young readers and their families. I recommend it highly. His first book, Black Men, Intergenerational Trauma and Behavioral Health, A Noose Across Nations was published in 2019. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for tonight's keynote presenter, Dr. Donald Grant. Take it away, Donald. Thank you so much, Charlene. Such a pleasure to be with you all. And I always say this, but I never do it. Donald, shorten your bio, shorten your bio. So you will be receiving a shortened bio from me. But again, um, such a such a pleasure to be with you all today. And, um, you know, to have this really important discussion, um, as we know, there are so many things going on right now that are playing a role in how uh, we're able not to just live our lives, but to raise our children and to um, kind of facilitate dialogues and have conversations that promote growth and that promote opportunity um, to really change the course of our future and, um, you know, do some resets. And so, uh, as Charlene said, I have a set of slides that I would love for us to dig into uh, for a bit. Um, we'll go through this kind of didactic framework for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have um, the back end of the meeting to have some conversation and discussion. And so um, racism, a systemic toxin, uh, learning to unlearn is where we start. And it's really important when we think about toxins and, you know, I have a degree in biology and I taught middle school science for a while. Um, I wanted to go to medical school and then um, I had an internship my junior year and realized, nope, medical school is not for me. And the only thing you could do with a bachelor's degree in biology at this time in the 90s was to teach middle school science. Um, and I loved it. Um, and it provided me with this really systemic framework that I operate from now. And that's looking at everything from a system. Um, as we mentioned, I have a doctoral degree in clinical psychology. I oversaw foster care systems from the Department of Mental Health side for a very small portion of LA County foster care. Um, I'm an equity, diversity, and inclusion trainer. I work with um, organizations large and small. I've uh, worked with a couple of financial organizations up north where you all are, uh, working with Viacom CBS, just finished work with the LA Dodgers doing um, a lot of their diversity work leading to the hiring of their vice, pres vice president of diversity, um, and do a lot of social justice work in my role at Pacific Oaks College. Um, and again, very happy to be here with you today. I wanted to start off, and I always start off with this concept or construct of mindfulness. It's really important that we pay attention to how we're experiencing today's conversation. When we think about really advancing work and really identifying our areas for growth, a part of that comes from our ability to not judge our experiences, to acknowledge that we had an experience or a reaction or we, it, we had an unlearning and it didn't feel good because you feel kind of duped. And then being able to say, wow, and hopefully after this, understand the structures put in place to make you feel the way that you do. And so it's important to note um, that the goal today is to get on the same page. The route to getting to that goal is to understand that we can be there even if all of our stories are different. Even if we have very different experiences, it's still possible to get on the same page. For instance, when we talk about um, you know, definitions and the ways in which uh, we have to move through this, these are some five, these are some steps that we can utilize that no matter what our experiences are, these are some things that we should be able to agree on that allow us to advance this work. And so I'll unpack them a little bit and we'll unpack them further as we move through the conversation. So the first thing is to learn common language. And that's what we'll do at the top of this um, presentation today is learn some common language so that we can use it in a way that's productive and we can share these definitions and use them accordingly. Uh, we wanna focus on equity over equality. Um, equity is, the, di the difference between equity and equality is where equity gives people what they need to thrive. Equality gives everybody the same thing, irrespective um, of what, they're, what space they're coming from or what their story is. We need to seek and decolonize data. We need to find information and we need to look at it through a critical lens to make determinations. And so for instance, when the eugenics movement was moving through North America, 
people believe that, and that was data, but it was colonized data. It was data that said black and brown people were genetically inferior to other people. That was data, but we had to decolonize it to really be able to use it. Unlearn historical revisionism, the stories that have been told to us throughout history that we've been conditioned to believe that aren't necessarily accurate at all or, or as accurate as, as they are being presented to be. And finally, practice brave behaviors and tough conversations. And that's what we're doing here today. Um, hopefully you guys will be able to leave with the model to be able to have these types of conversations in your communities. Notice, I don't say practice safe behaviors. A lot of people talk about creating safe spaces. My goal is not to create safe spaces, but to create brave spaces. And in order to do that, it's important to approach things head on. So you'll find with me, you're not going to get an appetizer. There's going to be no drizzle on your cheesecake, no chocolate drizzle on your cheesecake when we're done. We got to get in there so that we can really advance this work because it's critical. So when we talk about racism, it's oftentimes a discussion about white black. And certainly a lot of what we're gonna do today is grounded in that context. But what we'll make sure to also do is honor all of the different types of racism that we're experiencing right now. Um, we can't ignore the fact that our Asian American brothers and sisters are being hugely impacted uh, by some legitimate violence some serious, serious traumatic stuff. But we also can't act like this is the first time that this has happened. We've seen our Asian American communities be ravished and you know, everybody, oh, the Japanese internment camp. No, no, no. There's been much more history. And today, even though we'll be looking at this history through these kind of um, different ends of the continuum, um, our goal is to be able to thread the needle and understand that everyone's liberation, everyone's collective liberation is grounded in our individual freedoms. So when we look at common language, it's important to pay attention to words that have power and that all words do in fact have power. Um, and this first part, I wanna just break down these common terms that we oftentimes aggregate together in different ways. Um, and it's really important to know that we have to separate them a little bit and pay attention to how they play out um, in the world. So stereotypes are things that we kind of throw around all the time. And many people don't understand that stereotypes are formed as a result of the way that our brains function in general. So when you learn about unconscious bias or implicit bias, you'll see that in your workplace a lot um, or around the world. It's a great tool because it makes you aware of this stereotype process. Now, human beings are what we call cognitive misers, meaning we will want to utilize the least amount of cognitive energy to solve any problem that is presented to us. And in order to do that, we have to put these buckets together. These buckets that we put together we use them and they're called schemas and they're created by heuristics, H-E-U-R-I-S-T-I-C-S. And these heuristics are these mental shortcuts. The opposite of a heuristic is an algorithm. And so let's say an algorithm, the definition is um, a solution that will always get the accurate answer. So I haven't been to a fitness center, my gym, LA Fitness, I haven't been there in obviously over a year. Let's say I went to my gym bag, if I could find it, and found my combination lock. I have no idea what the lock, what the combination lock is. Now, a heuristic would lead me to try a few variations that I think it might be. 4, 15, 32, doesn't work. Not guaranteed to get the answer. It's a heuristic, it's a shortcut. Here are some common numbers that come top of mind that I think might be the answer. An algorithm is guaranteed to get you the right answer. But there's a problem with algorithms. When you use an algorithmic function to find that combination lock, you literally have to go through every single permutation that is possible. 001, 002, 003, 111, 112, 113. That's inconvenient. That's why the human brain doesn't use algorithms to solve problems, we use heuristics. These heuristics, as I stated, create these schemas or these boxes 
whereby you group things together and you take the information that you have about them and you create a thought. That thought is a stereotype. We have stereotypes about all sorts of things. We see a car and we assume something about that car. We have a thought about that car. Now, it may be because you know how much that car cost, you know people who drive that car and they're great people. So suddenly you create this thought about this car and the next thing it leads to a feeling. Maybe you see this car and you get warm and fuzzy inside. And you look at this car and you say, oh, this car, that car over there, mm -hmm. you have this feeling about the car. <clears throat> Excuse me. The concern is, is that cars don't have feelings. So when these stereotypes apply to people and animate objects, they have serious and significant outcomes. And so when I first moved to Los Angeles, I lived in a neighborhood that was primarily older uh, and primarily um, Orthodox Jewish uh, and primarily white outside of that. My wife and I, we, were, we weren't married at the time. Uh, and this was back in 2003. Um, I would jog down the street and I would watch people walk across the street away from me as I was coming jogging down the street. I've been a black man all my life, so I got it. But that didn't reduce the injury that that stereotype and that prejudice had upon me. Now, when you move that prejudice, that feeling that you have, that feeling that you have and it operationalizes itself outside of the body, that's discrimination. The behaviors associated with the feelings of prejudice that are born from stereotypes become discrimination. Now, when you drop discriminatory behaviors inside of a system, they become racism or sexism. Um, and that's an important distinction to note. And I hope that you guys are getting the distinctions between these three things because they are oftentimes used interchangeably. Now, here's an important part of the conversation, and this is where it gets a little rough. And I want you to practice a little mindfulness when you move through this part, is this construct of racism being grounded inside systemic oppression. Uh, as a diversity trainer, I've always gotten people who would be in presentations and they would Google the definition of of racism as I shared it with them. And they would say, look, Webster's Dictionary doesn't say anything about power. And so what that means is that anybody can be racist because it doesn't have power connected to it. Well, the interesting thing is we never focused on the fact that the definition inside of the dictionary may have in fact been a colonized definition. When you hear me talk about decolonizing definitions and decolonizing systems, um, I helped a library decolonize their library stacks. What we're talking about is identifying ways in which we are presenting information that speaks to a narrative that may not be accurate, that may be riddled with male privilege, may be riddled with Christian privilege or heterosexual privilege or white privilege. Here we see Merriam-Webster, um, obviously a noted um, player in the dictionary world, this third paragraph, we see editors added that although the dictionary aims to reflect the real world usage of a word rather than a particular viewpoint, we have concluded that omitting any mention of the systemic aspects of racism promotes a certain viewpoint in and of itself. It also, deserve, it also does a disservice to readers of all races. When we look at what the editors of this dictionary did, we have to ask ourselves a question. Has the definition of racism really changed? Or are we just describing it in a decolonized way? And the answer is, is that the definition, the actionable definition of racism has not changed. We're now in a space where people are brave enough to say racism is bigger than just discrimination. Because what that allowed us to do was to create a framework where we were able to say there are good stereotypes and people can be racist against white people. Now, again, this is gonna ruffle your feathers a little bit. And so I have an example to help us understand. Again, let me go back to the common language real quick. Remember, we're talking about the difference between stereotype, prejudice, discrimination, and now we're moving into a space where we're differentiating discrimination from racism. 
And what I'm saying in this example, which I haven't made acutely clear, is that if an individual is inside of the out group or the or is a part of the marginalized group, they don't have the ability to have the systemic oppression against another group. What that means is that women cannot be sexist. Can women discriminate against men? Certainly. And we'll talk about examples by which that might look. However, because women don't hold systemic power across the world, they don't have the systemic capacity, the institutional capacity to disenfranchise men. And the dictionary's definition has finally caught up with what many of us do to be true. And so here's another example. When we talk about people in the dominant group cannot be or hold the ism against the other groups. People oftentimes say that white people experience racism. As we move to brave spaces, as we move to decolonize definitions, we have to begin being a little bit more deliberate about how we speak. And one of the important pieces of this is this concept called reverse racism that does not exist. Here's why. So many of you may be familiar with these guys. And so um, the Beastie Boys, this great rap group um, who emerged in the 1980s, people say that the Beastie Boys experienced racism from black rappers when they were attempting to enter the space of the rap world. They said, oh, you know, nobody allowed them to enter. Everybody said that they were trash and that they couldn't rap and that they shouldn't be here. Now, the Beastie Boys obviously have proven themselves to be great hip hop artists. Were the Beastie Boys discriminated against in this particular area of music? Absolutely, unequivocally. Here's the problem. That discrimination would have never resulted in those three men getting a record deal. I'm gonna say it again. The discrimination from the black rappers in hip hop and rap music would have never stopped these guys from getting a record deal. That's the difference between discrimination and racism. Had the tables been reversed, they would have been able to not allow or to disallow a black person or a woman or a gay rapper if those tropes remained. And that's the part about the system by which this reinvented definition is so critical because we understand that even though Eminem and you know you may question Vanilla Ice and his um, hip hop artistry, however, he was a big selling artist. What we see is that there was not a possibility that even though black men and women, black men primarily, unfortunately, who primarily participated in this world, they didn't have the ability to not allow these men and all these other white rappers to get record deals. And that's the difference between racism and discrimination. Um, and so when we talk about racism, every single group of people is, is, is impacted by racism. It is a huge deal and there's nobody who is not impacted by racism. Um, and we have to first level set at that space to know that no matter who you are, no matter what background you come from, no matter what socioeconomic status you exist about, you exist in, racism, as in the title of this presentation, is a toxin that permeates evenly throughout the entire space in which we live. So I wanted to start with this concept of cognitive dissonance, which is a really important concept in understanding um, racism. Um, and it's another part of, it's another way in which the brain works and the brain operates. And what cognitive dissonance does is it is this concept that says, we can't have two things that exist at the same time in our minds that are contradictory. It's a conflict that occurs. And this conflict creates all sorts of dysregulation for people. And the goal is to resolve it. Research has demonstrated that cognitive dissonance is resolved in only two ways. One either changes their behavior or they change the truth. 
when we think about some of the research that has been done on cognitive dissonance, um, some of the research began on smokers. And so what they did was they brought all these people in the room um, who were smokers. All these individuals smoked at least two packs of cigarettes a day who will quantifiably by anybody's rubric be a heavy smoker. So what they did was they gave all the people in the study a um, survey about what they knew about how cancer was connected to smoking. And then they grouped the whole group into one group who had a lot of information about cancer and its connection to smoking, and one group who had a little bit of information about cancer and its connection to smoking. Then they asked them, they said, now I want you to self-identify. Do you identify as a heavy smoker or a light smoker? So I'll ask you to think about this for a moment. The individuals who had a lot of information about cancer and smoking, did they self-identify as a heavy smoker or a light smoker? I'll give you a moment to drop something in the chat box if you'd like to before I give the full answer on that. Uh, the question is, of those individuals who had a lot of information about smoking and cancer, did they identify themselves as a heavy smoker or a light smoker? light smoker. Good, good, good. Yeah. And you guys get the reason why. Because they changed the truth. Again, foundationally, all these people smoke more than two packs of cigarettes a day, which means they were heavy smokers. But in order to break the cognitive dissonance, you either quit smoking or you change the truth to something like, I'm not a heavy smoker. Well, the concern is that this played out in so many significant ways across our history. Right now I'm doing research on my third book and I'm digging into the identity development of individuals who have a history um, of experiencing the role of the oppressor. When we talk about cognitive dissonance, we have to think about the individuals who um, own enslaved people during the times of enslavement here on this land. We have to pay attention to the fact that many of these men and women went to church every Sunday. They loved their families. They did philanthropic work. Yet they were able to cut off a man's foot for trying to run away. They were able to hang a man from a tree for wanting to seek freedom. Those two things are conflicting. How can I be a God-fearing, family loving human being and treat another human being in this way. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's cognitive dissonance. So what we know, I just explained, the research says you do one of two things. You change the truth or you change your behaviors. The individuals who experienced cognitive dissonance who chose to change their behaviors, many of them became abolitionists. The individuals who chose to change the truth convinced themselves that Black people were subhuman. The only way you could, in fact, see yourself as a God-fearing, empathic human being and whip somebody until the, their back is scarred like this the only way that dissonance is resolved is to convince yourself that this person is not a human being. And then you see that legislated in the constitution even demonstrating that black people were three fifths of a person. There's a lot of politics behind that too that we won't have time to get into. Historical revisionism and negationism are also two major components in this. Um, I want to give you guys a moment to kind of pause and there may be people who feel a little dysregulated after that part. So practice a little mindfulness and think about um, what you are experiencing as we have this conversation. It's really important uh, to pay attention to that and think about that and, um, you know, even reflect upon it later. So historical revisionism and negationism is when we kind of change the stories of history to make them tell a story um, that didn't really happen. And that's why we must learn, unlearn, excuse me, 
everything that we have learned. We have to unlearn it. We have to look at this story here and decolonize it. When you look at this little boy's history book, we see the kind of areas that have been edited for our children to learn. And this learning has curated a sense or a maintenance of white supremacy across time. And remember, white supremacy is a philosophical framework. Um, when you think white supremacy, I don't want you to think KKK and you know um, Proud Boys and QAnon and Charlottesville. You can think those things. They're certain. I don't. I don't want you to not think those. I don't want you to only think those. Um, we have to understand that white supremacy is different than a white supremacist. White supremacy is a philosophical framework on which our country is built that describes the Eurocentric sensibility as normalcy. Again, white supremacy is a philosophical framework that centers white as the normal scale by which everything is measured by. And what we're talking about today are the systems that have gone into place to maintain that very lucrative system and how it's dismantling right now. And this history is an example of what that looks like. And so I just mentioned the business continuity model. Some of you may have seen it yet. I've not seen it yet, but there's apparently this cool documentary called The Last Blockbuster, which I do plan to watch at some point in time. But I use this example to say that Blockbuster is an example of a business that didn't have a business continuity model. And what I wanna do is talk just a little bit about the components of that so you understand what that is and how we move into the space of our current times and what that means. When we think about Blockbuster, we understand that Netflix and Redbox and whoever it was at that time came to them and said, hey guys, pretty soon you're gonna be able to watch a video or any movie you ever wanna watch sitting in your living room. Blockbuster was like, no, that's never going to happen. We're good. Rest in peace, Blockbuster. Blockbuster didn't have a business continuity plan. When we talk about business continuity planning, we're talking about identifying the risks that may be at bay and doing an assessment on that, analyzing how those risk factors may impact business outcomes, and then creating strategies that allow those business outcomes to be mitigated towards positive outcomes. Even though Blockbuster did not have a business continuity plan, America did. You have to realize that by 1860, America was exporting over 80% of the world's cotton, the world's cotton. What that means is that every piece of this new global economy was grounded in this free labor system. You would be naive to believe that at this time, these millions of dollars back in the 1800s, you would be naive to believe that people didn't get together to say, hmm, they're gonna free these people pretty soon. What are we gonna do about it? We have this free labor source that is moving these things in a way and advancing them in a way that if we lose it, it's gonna be problematic. And then in the 1840s, you saw laws coming in called convict leasing laws. You saw rules coming in that were created that were called vagrancy laws that said you can arrest people if they look homeless. You can arrest people if they look unemployed. You can arrest people if they look disheveled. Now, if I was enslaved last week and today, I'm not. What does that look like? How does that work? There is a consistent framework that has been utilized to maintain these tropes over time that keep the oppression of all groups of people in a variety of ways. And this is just the business continuity plan for Black Americans. When we look at domestic terrorism and we understand the efforts that were created to really push this forward and to say we want to continue to frighten these people and as we frighten them we frighten all the other groups of people who don't look like us in this framework lynchings were used heavily 
in order to make sure that people knew that white supremacy was key. Now, the one thing we don't always talk about is what I mentioned earlier, is if you look at this picture to the left, you see this little girl sitting here, standing here, excuse me. Those of you who are parents, think about that for a moment. Could you imagine coming home to your child and saying, hey, sweetie, grab a juice box. We're about to run, chase down a black guy, hang him from, set him on fire, and you're going to watch. These deliberate efforts to maintain a narrative have gone over generations. And we must understand the little girl in this picture is currently the age of the grandmother of a college student. This is not ancient history. Every generation of black person in America has experienced not just the historical trauma I'm referencing, but there has been a deliberate intentional trauma reminder in each generation. Here, we had Emmett Till, back in 1955 in Mississippi. Here we have James Byrd in 1998 for the son's experience. We have grandpa's experience. We have his son's experience. And then we have these young boys in today's lifetime who's ex who are experiencing um, what's happening now. And we, you know, we have this case in the news right now also um, looking at what's gonna happen with the police officer whose knee you see on that man's neck. When we talk about the deliberate model to maintain oppression, I want you all to understand that I'm only sharing this in this framework so that we could have a call to action that demonstrates the level of work that needs to go into fighting the battle to make sure that we can all experience safety. Now, the one question that we don't always ask as well is that, how did, how did European immigrants become white? We talk about this group of white people in America, but were they always white? Have you asked yourself that question? Even those of you on the call who identify as white, have you asked that question of yourself, of your, of your group membership? Well, the interesting thing is that when European immigrants arrived on this land, they weren't white, they were Greek, they were Italian, they were Irish, they were Polish. They weren't white though. And not many people ask the question, what was the development of white identity? Well, some people think it wasn't a very deliberate effort, but I wanna let you know that it was. The descendants of the colonists began to relegate all of the Eastern European immigrants into the communities to live with recently um, emancipated people who were enslaved. They began to see the Irish immigrants building unions and connecting with these individuals who they had put together in these spaces. And there was fear surrounding that. So what the descendants and the colonists began to do is they began to go to the, Europe, to the Eastern European immigrants and say, Mr. Polish man, if you shave off the SKI off the back of your last name, I'll let you enroll your kid in my school. Mr. Italian man, if you stop cooking all that garlicky pungent food, I'll let you buy a house on my street. What we know is that many immigrants were compelled to throw away their heritage, to throw away their culture in order to absorb into the experience of white privilege and gain the benefits associated with white privilege. That was all predicated upon this distance between white and people of color. When we don't talk about that, we don't understand the current context of what's going on. We don't understand what happened with the Georgia runoff elections and how this is one of only 10 states that has this possibility of having this double election. If many of you, I'm not a political scientist, but I remember thinking, why is it that they have another election. I thought it was done. Then I did a little bit of research and learned 
that the reason why this runoff exists is because what would happen is that Georgia used to have a weighted system, which was dangerous, and the um, Supreme Court outlawed it. It was a system um, that was the county unit system that allowed individuals in, um, in um, rural counties to have larger, have their votes count for more than one vote than in urban counties like Atlanta. Um, and we know what that looks like um, geographically and demographically. What we found was that when they got rid of this, when the Supreme Court demanded that they got rid of this, they moved to the two party election, the two um, round system. What the two round system said was, any black candidate was getting all the votes of all the black people. However, there were three or four white candidates and all those votes were split amongst all those groups. And what would happen is that the black person would get elected. So, oh, no, 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 we gotta stop that. So they created, they created the two round system. What that said was, okay, we're gonna throw it in the hat for the first time. And if nobody reaches a certain percentage overall, 50%, we're gonna have this next runoff. Now that's not how it works. It's the winner in most other elections. So now they say, we are gonna put all three of our white people up and let the white people choose who's their favorite white person. And then we're gonna run them against the black person or the other brown person. This is the first time in Georgia's history that we saw the election results where one Jewish man and one black man were able to be senators in the state of Georgia ever because of this system of systemic racism that created the two runoff system. Now, this is the first time that this system has failed white supremacy. Remember, white supremacy is a framework, it's a structure. People support it and people maintain it, but we have to think about it as a structure. This is the first time that the Georgia structure has not supported this larger structure. If you've been paying attention to the news in any way at all, you'll see they're also looking to change the constitution right now. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that the state of Georgia is now changing the constitution as a result of a trope of white supremacy no longer working. It's not a coincidence. The last thing I'll go through really quickly is this construct of intergenerational advantage and disadvantage. When we look at the experience of what America has provided to people and has not provided to people, I use this, uh, this construct of the GI Bill to give the example. And so um, in 19, I mean, um, in the 1940s and 50s, when war soldier, when soldiers were coming back from war, the US spent $95 billion on social programming. And that gave people job training, college tuition, home loans, all these different things. But what we know is that Latinx Americans, Black Americans, Asian Americans, they didn't get access to any of this. In fact, there are still rules on the books in lots of municipalities where we live where Asian Americans still are not, again, this is written down, can't buy a house in this neighborhood, where Black people can't buy a house in this neighborhood or is baked into the contract. They don't follow it, they don't enforce it but they still haven't removed it. And so when we think about the GI Bill, I'm gonna go through these two little stories really quickly so we can get to our question and answer time. Um, we have Philip. Philip is a white kid born in 1947 um, in Philadelphia. His dad, high school diploma, lives in a low interest house. And when he comes back from, um, when he comes back from the war, he gets all this access from the GI Bill. He's now able to move his family from public housing in a segregated, He's able to move his family from public housing to a segregated suburb. His family is able, then he, they're able to borrow money to send Philip to school. As a result of that, Phillips gets a professional job. He's the first kid in his family to go to school. He buys a home. He even inherits his father's home after his dad dies and he graduates college with no student loans. When we talk about Ray's story and we look at how this is a very disparate story, only difference being that Ray's dad was black and so was Ray. They couldn't afford to send Ray to college because Ray didn't get access, Ray's dad didn't get access to the GI Bill. Ray's dad 
couldn't move their family outside of the community where he grew up because he couldn't get mortgage. And even if he could have gotten a loan, there would have been redlining restrictions that allow, that didn't allow him to move into a neighborhood that may have been resourced in the way that he needed. He works in minimum wage job, continues to live in family home. He has to borrow money to bury his father after he dies. When we fast forward to Philip's kids, these are the grandchildren of the man who went to war. We see that Philip gives his children's father's appreciated home to them. They live in thriving communities. College was paid for with home equity. Philip establishes a trust fund for his grandchildren. This is what we refer to as three generations of accumulated advantage. When we look at this from the other side of Ray and look at Ray's children, there is no house to inherit. Ray's children live in disinvested communities. They complete college with work study and student loans. Ray has no personal assets to leave his grandchildren. As a result, we call this three generations of accumulated disadvantage. When we look at these systems at work, our goal is to begin to move into these practices. And what I wanna leave you with is my hope that you'll be able to take this information and move your behaviors from being actors to allies to accomplices. There's so many things happening right now that we don't have the luxury of being bystanders. The danger is real. And my hope is that you guys gain some information today that would allow you to act and fill your toolbox with opportunities to build cultural empathy so that you can help make a change and make it such that other people, including maybe you and your community, feel more safe, whatever that community is, whatever that intersectional community is that you may belong to. Um, thank you so much. We still got 15 minutes for some questions and answers. And so um, I would like to note that I normally go way over time, but I want to honor the questions and answers and the slides that I didn't get into. I'll make sure that we chat about some of those during the question and answer period. Well, thank you, Donald. That was incredible. We have a lot to think about, a lot of homework to do and a lot of cultural empathy to develop. As you said, it, it wasn't easy. And we can tell from some of the comments that it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to absorb. I, I know in graduate school, I took a course called Race, Gender, Inequality in the Law, and it changed me forever. It's something that once you see it and hear it, you can't go back, right? So thank you for opening our eyes to a lot of things that are not necessarily easy to hear. You Let's, can't unsee it. That's right. That's right. And I think on the TV screen, we're seeing a lot of things the last several weeks and months that we can't unsee either. Yeah, I tell you, I, if I could, as, as people think of questions they'd like to ask, I, I'd love to talk about this video that I saw, Charlene, and open up with this, if you if it's okay. Um, I, I, I was flabbergasted, not just at the violence but also at the lack of support. There was a, a, a woman, an Asian American woman, again, talking about the violence that we're seeing towards our Asian American brothers and sisters and the dangers um, there. And, and again, a lot of people are talking about this as though this is the first time that we've seen Asian Americans be disenfranchised. And I will not participate in that colonized discussion. It's a very colonized discussion. We have to understand that Asian Americans have been under attack since their moments existing on this particular land. So let's make sure we're clear about that. But what I'm bringing that up to say is that it's not only the brutality but also the way in which this particular recent video I saw, how there was a security guard inside the store from looking at, at, the, at the attack. Even if you're not gonna put your personal body in danger to stop something, the message of that door closing on that shop just spoke so loudly to the time and space that we're in. And that's why I was glad I was able to end on that slide of how do we become accomplices? How do we engage in actionable behaviors that allow change to happen? So Donald, that word often has a negative connotation. Tell me, is this something that we're using in the vernacular now or is this your phrase, accomplice? 
Yeah, no, it's 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 being used across the area of diversity and inclusion. And so um, some people use accomplice, other people use co-conspirator. Um, oh. And so the difference being that, um, you know, ally had been the word um, that we all used. And so one of the major differences is, is that an ally is the man who will go to the women's march and have this great sign and he's yelling and screaming and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. He pay equity, stop rape culture, kill toxic masculinity. You know, he's, he's there, he's supportive. He raises his daughters to be insightful. He does all those things. That's an ally. An accomplice is the man who will go to work and say, I know that Charlene and I do the same job, but I just found out Charlene makes 10% less than me. I'm willing to take a pay cut or find money so that Charlene can experience pay equity. Those are the differences. Accomplices and co-conspirators have skin in the game. Allies are supportive, but not in the same way. Okay. We need people to move from allyship to the co-conspirator accomplice lane. Okay. All right, so let's get at some of these questions, Donald. Here's a parent who asks, and I think this is on everybody's mind, what should we say when we hear inappropriate or racist language from a friend, colleague, or one of our children's friends? I'm never sure what to say or when to step in. It is so hard to, to kind of make those determinations. Um, I mentioned earlier about the difference between creating safe spaces and creating brave spaces we can no longer rely upon safety. We have to be brave. Now, everybody pay attention to their own experience with personal safety, all those things. I'm not encouraging anybody um, to put themselves in a space where they will be or experience um, bodily harm. But what I am saying is that the reason why these intergenerational components of racism, sexism, and homophobia continue to work is because we're at the dinner table and grandpa says some crazy stuff and we don't say anything. And our 10 year old, our 10 year old looks and says, oh, if mom and dad are cool with grandpa, that must be okay for them. That must be okay for us to talk like that. So first, I think the practice happens in your family where you, you demonstrate bravery and you say, grandpa, you can't say that anymore. That's not, that's not, we don't use that term anymore, grandpa, or, or, or you know, Uncle Joe, that's not, that's not how we speak about indigenous people anymore. You gotta be brave enough to do that because your children and the children around you, even if you don't have children, the people around you, they need models of bravery. We can't keep saying, oh, Uncle Joe, that's just Uncle Joe. Yeah. We can't do that. We can't do that. Now in public spaces, in meetings, in all these different spaces, we're in a, in a great space now where there are lots of different groups where at your workplace, there may be a diversity person who you can go to and get some support on doing that work. Um, but there's a lot of resources out there, but you gotta be brave enough to ask the question. You also have to do the learning. You gotta find a book, you gotta watch a movie. It's not hard. Right. I wanna share um, a comment that just came in, Donald, because I think it just really speaks to what you've accomplished tonight. Uh, Julie writes, thank you for your passionate allyship to Asian American community. We do have shared experiences and need to join together to dismantle the racism that persists and define the humanity and our fellow humans maybe join to become effective co-conspirators. I love it. I love it. I love it. We have to, um, you know, and that, that you know, now th what I'm about to say right here is going to be a little bit tough right here, given the fact that this is where we're talking about right now. We also have to pay attention to how white supremacy works to separate groups of people. Um, right now, you see with what's happening, all the horrors with the Asian American community, we have to understand that this concept, friends, I'm sure many, most are familiar with the concept of the model minority stereotype. And I should have mentioned that when we were defining stereotype earlier, 
the model minority stereotype was something created by white supremacy's framework to maintain separation between other groups of black and brown people. If I tell Asian Americans that they are the salt of the earth, I make other brown people not connect with them. And I make them afraid to stand up for the rights of other people. Now we're at a space where all those things are being dismantled and we're able to see how white supremacy has worked to really fool everybody and convince us of thoughts and ideas that are, just aren't true. And so we have to begin to unpack and unlearn those things so we can practice a different way forward. Okay, so in the spirit of courageous conversations, Donald, let's, let's we have a couple of um, comments here who are, I think referring to your slide about reverse racism is not a thing, okay? Yeah, here good, we go. good. I know you're ready. If white supremacy is a philosophical framework that centers white as the normal state by which everything is judged, then what is black supremacy? Is it not the exact same thing, but the other side of the color spectrum? It's a great question. Um, there, I've never heard the term black supremacy. We do talk about the black power movement and we do talk about different things like that. So, you know, I'll presume that the um, uh, participant is speaking about that concept. Um, and so it's an important question to ask because these are the questions that we need to ask one another to be able to really unpack this. And that's an example of how I was describing the difference between racism and discrimination. Um, in that, when we talk about an individual walking down the street with a, um, you know, a Japanese flag saying, I'm so proud of my Japanese heritage, that's because that Japanese man and woman has been told that their heritage is devalued underneath the framework of white superiority. And what we have to do is understand that other groups have to identify their relevance in this way in order to be a part of the conversation. It's the same thought that you have when you hear people say, you know, female power, girl power, girl magic. When you have men who are saying, well, what about, what about boys? What about men? I mean, we do have a lot of work that we need to do for our boys, so I don't want to minimize that at all. But what I'm saying is, is that men don't walk around in a world where they're afraid of being raped as they walk to their car at night. The system doesn't disenfranchise men in that way. And so when women talk about girl power, they are fighting to dismantle a system that has strategically been placed to disenfranchise them. That's why you don't see enough women scientists. That's why you don't see enough women CEOs. That's why you don't see enough women astronauts. That's why you don't see ever a woman president. That's why this is the first time we've ever seen a female vice president. So girl power is an effort to disrupt the deliberate system that has been put in place to make women and girls live in a more dangerous world. Black power, Asian power, Latinx power, those are associated with dismantling the system of supremacy that has created significant barriers for people of color to move through. I hope that was helpful. I think so, Donald. Here is a really practical question that I think is a good one as we have just a few minutes left. What can we do in our everyday life and our local communities to take small steps to make change? Yeah. Um, be deliberate um, about everything you do. For instance, you got to eat. Um, why not be deliberate on choosing a restaurant owned by somebody who's Latinx, somebody who's gay, somebody who's Asian American, somebody who's underrepresented. Look at where you spend your philanthropic dollars. You may be able to shift some of those and say, okay, I am going to give I'm going to take 15% away from over here, and I'm going to give it to a local high school to do a book scholarship for a under-resourced school where this kid who only needs $500 to be able to buy their books for the year, I'm going to move $500 of the $3,000 that I'm giving over here, I'm going to move it over here. When you're buying your books from Amazon, 
why not identify a black or brown owned bookstore in your community and buy your book from there? You can still order it online. You don't have to go into the brick and mortar. Most of them have online platforms. So being able to be practical about where you allocate your resources is one of the, I mean, you know, if we had another hour, we can go into a whole bunch of stuff, but being deliberate about that is one way to dismantle some of these systems, but also taking opportunities to learn. That's why it's so valuable that 60 people are on this call today who will be able to share this information and share this concept, even if you're not walking away buying everything that I'm selling tonight, that's okay. It's going to open up your thought process to say, hmm, I at least want to dig in a little bit more. This dude seems a little credible. Maybe he's, you know, not all smoke and mirrors. And so my hope is that those of you who are walking away, you know, still questioning some of these, some of this work. And it's important that you do, that you then take the next step to say, okay, I'm going to open up my Netflix account and I'm going to watch the documentary 13th. I'm gonna watch the documentary 13th this weekend and learn about it. Or I'm gonna pay attention to the um, Derek Chauvin uh, murder case. And I'm gonna figure out how black people are experiencing the intergenerational trauma associated with watching this happen over and over. I'm gonna assess the number of things that I see that are supporting Asian American um, crime and, and Asian American hate crimes. I'm going to see how much they call them hate crimes and how it differs from other groups. And I'm going to, you know, post on social media about it or write the editors of LA Times. Like those are small things that don't take a lot of effort. There's so many more. Yes, exactly. You know, like you said, language is powerful. I was reading today about girls who are often referred to as underage women. There are no underage women, they are girls. And if they're being trafficked or abused, that's. I was right. listening to the guy who's been, I know there are no charges in place yet, but the guy who he was like, and they say, I took this 17 year old woman. She's a girl. I'm like, when, when did the 17 year old become a woman? Right. right. Yeah. So Donald, I want to respect your time and everybody's time who's been with us tonight. We thank you all for joining us. What? final thought would you like to leave us with? What do you want people to take away from tonight's courageous conversation? No matter what you look like, no matter what your experience is, we have to pay attention to the fact that everybody's liberation, all of our freedoms are grounded in our collective freedom. So we have to fight for everybody's rights. If you don't believe in, you know, different areas that somebody is telling you is their truth, it's up to you to learn and unlearn and be brave enough to unlearn and say, hmm, maybe I think this, but maybe it's not true. And maybe it's important that I discover that. And so that's what I would love to leave everybody with is the permission and the call to action to dig in a little bit more from this today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Donald Grant, for tonight and for all the education that you've offered our communities this year and to the Fremont Union High Schools Foundation for sponsoring this really important conversation. Again, thank you, thank you. We're gonna say goodnight, everybody. We hope that you take care, stay well, have a good spring break, and we will see you soon.